All right, for the hundreds in attendance and the thousands watching at home, let's go ahead and get started with this. All right, so first thing I have is I posted a link in the chat box, which is a just a link to um, a YouTube video that shows you how to build your own goniometer. So it's one of those things that, you know, you don't necessarily need to do it by, per se, but it is going to be very helpful for you to have one um, if you're not able to, like, say, buy one. I mean, I haven't looked too recently on, like, say, Amazon or anything for one. Yeah, so I mean, even if you get like a really good one, they are only like six, seven bucks. But at the same time, I realize that that's, uh, you know, still kind of inconvenient to have to do that. Ooh, this is actually pretty neat here. I've never seen a digital one like that. That'd be pretty cool. But either way, um, link in the chat box will give you or let you know how to make your own goniometer. So you can always do that. So today, all I really want to do is go over the manual muscle testing for the ankle. So hopefully it doesn't take all that long. All right, so we've gone over everything from range of motion and the movement analysis, but just to go back over this, Remember still, with the sagittal plane, that the axis that the sagittal plane moves around is always perpendicular to the plane itself. So that means it's going to be the medial lateral axis. And let me pull up this real quick. And here again is your chart that gives you everything you need. So, oops. For the sagittal plane, remember the sagittal plane splits your body into a left and a right side. So that means it is splitting you straight up and down. Your axis is going to be perpendicular to that, so that has to be medial lateral. Your frontal plane splits you into a front and back. So perpendicular to that is anterior posterior. So if I'm looking at someone from the side there, the axis is going to split them back into a front here and a back, or an anterior and a posterior. And so my axis is going to run forward backward, which is your anterior posterior axis. Transverse plane is going to slice you into a top and bottom, but more importantly, it slices you into a um, oh my gosh, what's the name of the cut that it does? cross-section. There we go. So if you're looking on, like, say, any sort of, like, microscope slide, and you saw a cross-section view, that means it's a transverse view. That means you're looking straight up and down at that thing. So my axis is going to be longitudinal, so it's straight up and down. Transverse plane is all rotation. Frontal plane is ab adduction. Sagittal plane is your flexion extension. All right. 
Now, if you are moving your foot or your ankle, so the dorsum or back of the foot, think dorsal fin on like a dolphin or a whale or a fish, your dorsal fin is on your back, okay? So the dorsum of your foot is going to be the top of your foot. So if I'm looking at the dorsum of my foot, there it is right there. I made sure to have my wife give me a mini mani petty, so I'm sure my foot's looking at least pretty decent. So if I move the dorsum or back of my foot anteriorly, so towards the anterior tibia, that means here's my tibia, right here, dorsum of my foot. If I move this towards this, I do this motion, which if I look from the side, looks like that. That there is your dorsiflexion. So dorsi, dorsal, flexion, moving towards that anterior tibia. There's your dorsiflexion. If I move the dorsum of my foot, away from my anterior tibia, and again, it's all in the sagittal plane. So if I take this and move it away from this, it looks like that. So now, if I did go back to my dorsiflexion, you notice how I have a small angle here. So I have a angle that's less than 90 degrees going from there to there. If I do this, now that angle is greater than 90 degrees here. So that is now plantar flexion. I'm planting my foot on the ground. Dorsiflexion, I am raising my foot off the ground. To measure dorsiflexion, Remember that I have to take my axis and I put it just below my ankle bone. I have my movable arm going down my first metatarsal, running straight through what would be my big toe. I have my fixed arm going straight up on my tibia. So I start out at 90 degrees. I go up and measure that way. The difference between where I'm at versus where 90 degrees was is where my measurement is. If you can kind of see on there, which I know there's a pretty bad glare to it. But that there is right between 100 and 110 degrees, so roughly 105. So if I started at 90, so I started right here at 90, I moved to 105-ish. That would mean that I get 105 minus 90 equals 15 degrees of dorsiflexion. For plantar flexion, I do the exact same thing, exact same setup, starting at 90 degrees, except I just go straight up onto my toe like that, and then I'll measure the exact same way, 90 minus whatever my endpoint is. For me here, my endpoint was approximately a hundred and, well, I'll see if I make it easier for you. So my, my end point is like 125 if I go from the bottom side. But if I just go straight from the top side here, which would be even easier to help you to visualize. And again, I apologize about the glare, but it's kind of hard to get clear things to show up correctly on the, on the screen. Um, so hopefully you can see that this right here says 60. 
So I'm a little bit past that. So if I take 90 minus 60, that equals 30 degrees. And so again, there is your plantar flexion. With inversion, eversion, well actually let me do the great toe extension because it's the exact same thing. So with great toe extension, you actually want a smaller goniometer, which you know we don't have, and heck even I don't have right now. <laughs> um, but all I would do with this is I take my axis, I put it right on the side of that big knuckle joint on my big toe. My fixed arm goes straight up my um, first metatarsal, my movable arm goes straight down the big toe. I extend my toe upward and I just get my measurement there. So whatever the measurement says, that's what it is for me. I have all of about 25 degrees of extension there. Um, normal is 50 to 70. So I mean, you could tell that's not like 50 degrees is gonna be, I can't even get it. <laughs> can't even force it up there. That'll be closer to 50. So this is zero. This is roughly 45. If I were to stick my toe straight up and down like that, that would be 90. So it'd be going from here all the way, gosh, I can't even manipulate my hand to do that, but it'd be going all the way straight up would be 90. So you're looking at roughly you know, that midway point would be what would be normal here. Now for inversion, eversion, remember these two go the exact same setup. For both of these, I'm going to take my axis and I'm gonna put it straight in the middle between my two ankle bones. So I put that straight there. I take my fixed arm and I go straight up my leg, my movable arm, I line up with my third toe. And you want to get this, so you start at 180. So you want to start just in a straight line there. So now, even though you really can't see so well, this here is in alignment with this here and my goniometer is at 180 degrees or zero. So that means that wherever I move, I just take whatever the number says as my movement. And then now when I go into inversion, I just move my foot inward. And now I just see what the reading says there for me. I moved from about this 180 over to about here, which is 30 degrees, if you can see that. Perfect, so that's about 30 degrees I have of inversion. Normal inversion should be around about 45 degrees. Let me just double check that. Yeah, no, sorry, inversion 30 degrees. Actually, I'm right on, right on it there. All right, and then eversion. Again, same exact thing, lining it up the same exact way. And I just move my foot outward. And again, I just follow straight on that um, third toe. Okay. And from there, Here we go, you can see that's right in between that 10 and 20. I'm actually at about 14 degrees there. So there is my, all of my um, uh, range of motion test there for the ankle. 
Okay, so let's get into the manual muscle test. I'm just going to space these out so that it'll be a little bit easier to do them. All right, first two here, gastrox and soleus. These are the easiest ones to do. All you're doing at these is you have your person stand straight up. Sorry, let me see if I can not blind you so much. I guess it's a little better. Anyway. Okay, so gastrox and soleus, you do these at the same time. Well, not the both tests, but you do both sides of your muscle at the same time. Now, what you can do is you can do this unilaterally where you have someone stand on one foot to do the test. You don't have to do that. So the only time you would want to really go unilateral for the test, so test each leg individually, if one leg has a noticeably big difference in structure or strength in the other. So for our purposes though, you're gonna do them at the same time. For the gastrox test, legs are straight. So you are just extending the leg so it's perfectly straight and you are going up on your toes and back down. And you wanna do this a total of 25 times. If you can get to that full 25 times, it'd be a grade of a five. If you can only get to 20, it'd be a four. Um, if you can do it at all, like if you can even do one of these, it's at least a three. To get the soleus, I'm doing virtually the same test, except now I'm going to bend my knees. So. I'm just kind of overbending it to give you guys a better view here, but you would bend this to 25 degrees is what you should bend that to. So if I'm doing gastrox, this is straight 180. For soleus, I'm bending it to 25 degrees. Now, the way I'm bending it here is a lot deeper, but I'm again, I'm just doing that so that you get a good, better visual. And now, same exact thing, I'm just going straight up on my toes, back down, and I'll be doing it for that same 25 times. If I can do it 20, 25 times, grade of five, I can do a 20, grade of four, and so on. So for both of these, you're doing just toe raises. For gastrox, you are going to have just like that. So no examiner resistance for these. Now, if you look online, there actually is a version of these where you have someone that would lay down supine. So I'll well, screw it. Got the time, I guess, right? <laughs> so you'd have someone laying supine. And what I would do is I would have my legs again fully extended and I would push down while my partner or someone would resist me back up. So I'd be trying to push them down into plantar flexion and you would try to pull them back up. That's how you can actually manually test for gastrox. Soleus would be the same thing except the knee bent. So if I had that knee again bent here to this 25 degrees and I did that same push down into plantar flexion while my partner would pull me back up, that would again be the, another way you can test that. Oh, it does not feel good to be doing knee tests when you have bad knees. 
Okay, so there's gastrox and soleus. Tib anterior, tib posterior. Remember that tib anterior and tib posterior share a common movement. That is going to be a test question for you. I guarantee it. <laughs> Their common movement that they share is both of them are going to help with doing ankle inversion. They both share that. So if I move this foot inward like that, I'm using both tib anterior and tib posterior. And you can feel it. If I take my hands and you go right to the bottom of your calf, so where your calf muscle ends, and take both hands, wrap it around the bottom of your lower leg just like that, and then move your foot inward, so it's show me your bottom of your foot, you'll feel flexion, or you'll feel a, a your muscle tensing up, both on the back of your leg and the front of your leg. The front of your leg, tib anterior, the back of your leg, tib posterior. So you'll feel both of those contracting. So that's how you know they both work there. Now, what tib anterior does is dorsiflexion. That is its primary role there. So when I am testing for tib anterior, I'm primarily testing dorsiflexion. If I'm testing tib posterior, Tib posterior is going to be my primary inverter, but it does a little bit of plantar flexion as well. So tib anterior does dorsiflexion, tib posterior does plantar flexion. And it makes sense because remember that whole form follows function because your tib anterior is on the front of your foot or on the front of your leg, I should say. It has to move your body forward. So it has to move you into ankle inversion, or I'm sorry, um, ankle dorsiflexion and foot inversion. Tib posterior, because it's on the back of your leg, is going to help get you into your ankle plantar flexion. So when I test this now, tib anterior, I wanna test dorsiflexion. That's what I'm testing there. For tib posterior, I'm testing inversion. Now, the way you do this for dorsiflexion is you can do one of two ways. You can either have the person like sitting down on a table and you would do that so that you as the partner don't have to get on the floor. I'm going to show you how to do it kind of from the floor because it's a little bit easier from my perspective to be able to video that for you. So again, if I'm doing just normal dorsiflexion, I just move that up just like that, okay? And so there's my dorsiflexion. All I do to test tib anterior is you get your partner to be in this position and you are going to push them down and that's it. Again, I'm just showing you this from my perspective because it's a lot easier for me to be able to visualize that for you. Um, you want to ideally have them sitting so that this is 90 degrees and this is 90 degrees. Sorry, mind the hound there. What is also beneficial is if you had someone sitting up where their foot's off the ground, that'll also be beneficial for you there. And again, you would wanna have them sitting so again it, that their leg is at 90, their knees flex to 90 degrees, their ankles at neutral 90 degrees. So having them off the ground, that'll give you an easier range of motion for that. So that's all you do for tib anterior. For tib posterior, I'm gonna go into inversion So what I got here for tib posterior is again, I want my ankle to be at 90 
I want my knee as well. So my knee should be flexed here to 90 degrees as well. And I'm going to go into inversion, but I also want to go into a bit of plantar flexion. So if I just elevate my foot here, just to give you a better look, that would look like this and this. So full inversion means that I turn my foot fully in, but I also want to get it plantar flexed. This will give me the most amount of posterior tibialis work I can. Okay, so for this one, a little bit of plantar flexion and inversion. What you're going to do as the resistor or the examiner is you are going to try to get me to go into dorsiflexion and eversion. That means I'm going to take your foot and go from here and pull it back this way. So my foot is going down and over. You are trying to pull it up and away. Okay? So down and over is where my positioning starts. Up and away, I try to pull you, and you resist to that. All right, fibularis. Remember that fibularis, it can also be called peroneus, means towards the fibula. Tibialis means towards the tibia. So for everything tibia related, you are going medially. For everything fibula related, you're going laterally. Fibularis, your primary role of this, eversion. So when I do fibularis, I am doing the almost the same thing I did with the tibialis posterior. So with tibialis posterior, I go inversion. With fibularis, I go eversion. And you want the foot to be elevated slightly. So you don't want this person sitting from like an elevated plane. So you push your, your foot into eversion. And then all I'm going to do is the resistor is try to pull you into inversion. So you're going to resist me pulling you that way. So that's it. Your halicus muscles, remember, halicus equals thumb, okay? I'm sorry, not thumb, big toe. Polycus equals thumb. Halicus is your big toe. So if I'm fl using, doing flexor halicus longus, all I'm doing here is I'm taking my big toe and I'm flexing it. So big toe is flexed. What you would do is the resistor, you would take a finger and you would try to pull me into extension. So I'd start here. I wanna get that finger hooked around and pull up. So I would try to resist just like this. That is my flexor halicus longus. For extensor halicus longus, I'm trying to put my toe into extension. Again, I take a single finger, I'm gonna put it on the toenail um, and just push straight down and you want to try to get that toe to stay up. So real simple for that. And that's really about it. So we showed you the navicular drop test last time. Remember with your navicular drop test, and you can still almost kind of see my, my marks here. So remember, this is my ankle. This there is where my navicular bone is. I would put a mark there. I would line up a piece of paper here showing you where that mark is. So for me, that first one's here. And then I stand up. I mark again where my navicular drops to. And then I measure the difference between the two. If you have a difference of at least 10 millimeters, positive test equals 10 millimeter drop or more. Again, this will be a test question. 
So you need to know this. What that actually means is that if my foot drops this 10 millimeters, so if I have that from one to two, and this here is 10 millimeters or more, that means that I have excessive pronation of the foot. So a positive test equals pronation. And I should kind of mention say positive high test. If I have a positive low test, that equals supination. And supination is equal to having a foot drop of less than four millimeters. Supination means you have high arches. Pronation means you have flat feet. All right, so that is all of the new material I have for you today. Um, Lainey, did you have any questions for me while you're here? No, not that I could think of right now. Okay. Um, on Wednesday, we're going to finish up with the foot and ankle. So I'm going to go, I'll just be doing kind of a review of that. Then on Sorry, I'm just trying to pull up. There we go. So we'll be finishing up, um, whoops, foot and ankle this week, or on, I guess say on Wednesday. Remember that this Sunday, you have all of your unit six stuff due. Um, then we're gonna get into the spine and posture analysis. Next week, remember that your final project where your paper is due. So that's worth 10% of your grade. Make sure you get that in kind of thing. Um, so we'll be spending the next couple weeks on the spine and doing posture. For um, unit eight, we're going to have really, um, I mean, it's gonna make it a lot easier for us now to cover this because we don't have to have class. So I'm actually gonna change, let me change this real quick. So this is going to be due actually on May 10th. And I'm going to make it available starting on the 6th. So I will be um, posting the exam in the actual exam or online, I should say. Whoops. Is this multiple choice? Yes. Oh my gosh, what is happening in my thing? Sorry, all of a sudden my uh, keyboard went dead. All right, so I will be doing that. Um, you'll be doing this online. And then I'll give you multiple attempts. Because why not?
but it will be over everything here. So there's, we're not gonna have any problems with covering all the material because now we get that extra class time. So instead of having to take the, um, uh, the test in class, you'll have that on the other, or you'll have that last class day for material. And I'm gonna give you a time limit too, because why not? So 120 minutes. Yeah, that should be good. So originally you had 45 minutes to do this. Um, so I think that's pretty fair to give you roughly triple the time. <laughs> um, originally the exam was gonna be 35 questions. So I'm giving you a couple more, but I'm also allowing you to have multiple attempts at it and giving you more time to do it. So. I think that's about as fair as I can make this for you. But the second exam is only going to be from unit four to unit eight. The majority of this is going to be from units four, five, six, seven. So I would say roughly 10 questions on the hip and pelvis, 10 on the knee, 10 on the foot and ankle, 10 on the spine and posture. And then they'll probably be between gait, um, sports activities and movement screening. They'll be roughly 10, but it won't be, and you'll probably actually be a little bit less than that. So I might just do like a couple more on each of the first four units. So yeah, let's say like roughly 11 questions on each of the first four units and then maybe about six on unit eight. So unit eight will definitely be the least amount of questions for your final, but you'll still have it. You also have more stuff to do in terms of the unit eight things. So keeping that in mind as well. But that gives you your rundown for the rest of the term. I mean, we're only a month away. So um, everyone's doing still really well, which is great. We just gotta keep up this good work here. But again, that's everything new I have. So thank you all for getting through that with me. Um, if you have any questions, I'm always here. Um, make sure you send me a text message. That'll be the easiest way to get a hold of me. If not, I will hopefully see some of you on uh, Wednesday. Thank you.